welcome back to the Non-Believer Bible Club. Before we begin today, I wanted to talk more about something that happened in our last reading, Genesis 7.24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. It's Non-Believer Vocab Time. Non-Believer Vocab Time! This is an example of what is called ascension. Ascension. Entering heaven. Alive. What this means, essentially, is that you get to enter heaven without having to die. God just picks you up and you go directly into heaven. This is something that only a few people are believed to have done. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, based in Eastern Europe, it is believed that Mary, upon her death, was transported by her son directly into heaven. No pain, no suffering. She ascended. This is known as the Assumption of Mary. And there's some great art on this. Nearly every word that I mention from the Bible has some good art. So do yourself a favor and take some time to explore the world of Christian art. If it's only hinted at vaguely in the Bible, 17 masters have painted their life's work about it. We'll call it Rule 777. If it exists in the Bible, there is art of it. Another small character in the Bible considered to have ascended Jesus, he is risen. While I was researching Ascension, I discovered that Jesus hung out after he was resurrected for 40 days, appearing and disappearing to his friends, pulling pranks probably, and teaching them how to continue his ministry. On the 40th day, the apostles are said to have all witnessed Jesus ascend into heaven before their very eyes. I guess he just rose up and got smaller and smaller. Rule 777, there is great art on this. The Ascension of Jesus is also celebrated with the Feast of the Ascension, held on the 40th day after Easter. And it's always a Thursday. Thought that was cool. Lastly, a more recent interpretation of the end of times, known as the Rapture, is considered by some to be a future event which will involve the Ascension of all of mankind. So. Enoch was the first. He will not be the last. But for now, let's continue our reading. Joineth me as Noah, his family, and the creatures enter the ark. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou, and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast, thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his female. So here's a perfect textual example of what we discussed in the last episode, the theory that the Bible was written by multiple authors. Genesis 6.19 And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, and they shall be male and female. Ah! But we were just told in Genesis 7-2, of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. So here is what some Bible scholars see as evidence of two different drafts by two different authors. There are little hangnails like this every now and again. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife, and his son's wives with him, into the ark, because of the waters of the flood. Of clean beasts, and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls, and of every thing that creepeth upon the earth. Creep! I like the the things that creepeth upon the earth. I don't know why. There went in two and two unto Noah in the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days, that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, 
in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. I wonder what this significance of the number forty is. Christ waits forty days before he is ascended. The same number of days that Noah waits in the ark. In the selfsame day entered Noah, and Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them, into the ark. They, and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. I like this song-like repetition of words and phrases that we've heard before. Every beast after his kind. And they went into Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. Hmm. So Noah didn't close the blast door or anything. God shut him in. Or I guess if Noah didn't shut himself in, he's going to drown. So it's all God's fault anyway. The flood. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth. And the waters increased and bare up the ark. And it was lift up above the earth. It's a spaceship now. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. Ooh. Yeah. Calling back Genesis 1-2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So, direct evidence that Noah is now surviving due to the power of God. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the water prevail, and the mountains were covered. I wonder who made that measurement. And all flesh that moved upon the earth, both of fowl, and of cattle, and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man all in whose nostrils was the breath of life. All that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth an hundred and fifty days. Another writer. (laughs) Not forty days. Forty days, a hundred and fifty days. Who knows? And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month, and in the tenth month, On the first day of the month were the tops of the mountain seen. And it came to pass at the end of forty days, forty interesting days, forty one hundred and fifty days, that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up off the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were 
on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. Kind of intimate. I wonder where the raven is, though. Second writer. Uh, J. Writer. Okay, so before I continue, a brief look at the writers of the Bible. Among the Eloist, Deuteronomist, and the priestly source, the lion's share of Genesis seems to be attributed to the Yahwist or J. Writer, with interjections from the priestly source. Scholars are mostly sure they've got their attributions down, while others remark that there may not even be a J. Writer at all. So as we continue to read, try to see if you can tell when the voice changes. It should be pretty obvious. It'll be two conflicting pieces of information directly next to each other. And he stayed yet other seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him. And in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. Broke up. Hmm. And it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee, of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful, and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth. I, I really, I just want to know, what are the creeping things? Does that mean spiders? Or does it mean lizards? What are the creeping things? What, what is the definition of a creeping thing? I need to know. After their kinds, went forth out of the ark. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Yo, let them let procreate first. That was the last clean beast. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living, as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time, and harvest, and cold, and heat, and summer, and winter, and day, and night shall not cease. Wow, I did not know that there is a point where God openly acknowledges that his creation man is not what he believed it to be. Or he openly acknowledges that his creation is flawed. He's like, you know what? The imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, but I'm not going to kill them anymore for it. I've smoted them. I smite them. I've got it out of my system. And then the other thing that I enjoyed was the very Greek savor of sacrifice. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, Ah, they're not that bad. Reading from Homer's Iliad, They then offered unblemished hecatombs to the immortals, and the wind carried the sweet savor of sacrifice to heaven. But the blessed gods partook not thereof, for they bitterly hated Ilion with Priam and Priam's people. <laughs> it's not going to turn out well for Troy, but back to this epic. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply 
and replenish the earth. It's a lot of earth to replenish. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Second appearance of the green herb. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Against cannibalism, good move. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So here we have a clear re-establishment of the rules. Cain killed his brother, but was allowed to live. Now anybody who kills anybody must die, must suffer the consequences, including judgment by his peers. By man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Another important thing to note, and I think it's kind of funny. He reestablishes that even though he's gone out of his way to make sure Noah saves all the animals, they are by no means equal. So like, yes, still kill, kill them, but don't kill each other. And you, be ye fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth, the rainbow. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. This is very important, because this is one of the early covenants that God will be making throughout this book. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant, which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, and Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. So begins one of the most oft-quoted and discussed parts of the Bible were at page 7 in My King James, episode 3. The following story, I'd say, is the number one reason why I wanted to start the Non-Believer Bible Club. Because if things can get as crazy as it's about to get on page 7, I had to read the whole thing. <sighs> These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Wow. And no, so we're all cousins. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Okay, here we go. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward 
and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him, what his younger son had done unto him, had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. (laughs) What did Canaan do? A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. He's 900 years old. And all the days of Noah were 950 years. And he died. Okay, let's talk. There are many possible interpretations to what we've just discussed. On the surface level, we have a man going into his father's tent, seeing that he's naked, and then telling his brothers, look, dad's naked, while the brothers preserve the modesty of their father. Ham has betrayed him and not done so, therefore he's expelled. But it gets a little hairier. (laughs) It gets a little more complicated when we start looking at the meanings behind this. For instance, the name of Ham's son, the one who was cursed. Pretty gangster going after his son, by the way, especially when it's his son's son. But the name of the son is Canaan, father of the Canaanites. The Canaanites lived in Canaan, which was a civilization in the ancient Near East, specifically around modern Israel and the Levant. So one interpretation is historical. There were the Israelites and the Canaanites, and they say, well, those guys we don't like there are descended from Ham, so that's why we don't like them. But it gets hairier still in the same way that Adam knew his wife, knew being a euphemism for having sex with. Some scholars take interpretive liberties with the word saw when he saw the nakedness of his father. Some scholars interpret that to mean, naturally, that he either castrated or sodomized him. Those who are familiar with Greek mythology know that Zeus's father, Kronos, castrated his father, Uranus. I said Uranus, so it doesn't sound like Uranus. Now I can be taken seriously. So we see this tradition of sons going against fathers repeated here, possibly. And yet there is one more interpretation. When we look at Leviticus 20.11, it reads, And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. What does this mean? The man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. If Ham, in verse 22, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, that could mean He had sex with his mom, Noah's wife. This would explain the curse on the child, Canaan, being produced by incest. So we have the first sin, the first murder, now the first incest. Bad, very bad. Bad ham. Theological interpretation, historical interpretations aside, What we have here is a story about how when the world had been freshly cleaned and made new, a son betrayed in some way his father. This is at the beginning of a new world when everything is supposed to be good. I guess I take this to mean that in the end, even after immense strife, as God said, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. The world that we are being shown 
by this book is a world in which men are constantly at odds with our baser, eviler natures. And so early on, at the beginning of human civilization, as described in the book, the most important thing that it's trying to tell us is that if you sin, if you give in to this, you will be punished. Blood for blood. We've gone from the breath of life to the blood. Blood screams from the ground when Abel is murdered. We were described as having breath. Now, blood is the breath of life. Blood must not be spilled. This is a new beginning, but with new responsibility. God has lifted the curse on the ground. We can be fruitful again, but we will also be damned if we mess up. In the same way that God has had to come to terms with the iniquity of man, his creation, we also have to learn how we are going to operate in this world. God has said that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. So he's given us this warning at the outset. And then later, the Bible shows that God was correct. God says we suck. Now we know why and exactly how much we suck with ham. Bad ham. Out of three kids, one of Noah's sons betrayed him. So we are about one-third damned. That's what we have to live with. But we can live with that, because God can live with it too. Genesis 9.13 I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Man has the ability to do evil things, but there is a part of him that can be saved. I spoke about the prefiguration of Christ in an earlier episode. In spite of all the violence and evil and incest, the ultimate theme of the story of the flood is that the evil of man shouldn't overshadow the goodness of man. It's a story about responsibility and forgiveness. Not a small theme in this book. For now, we'll stop here. Thank you for joining me on the Non-Believer Bible Club. Keep calm and creepeth on.